Ave Maria Purissima. Um, just a note on Lent, thinking about that. Uh, the first time I heard talking in church, I was a senior in high school. It was the first time I'd been to a Protestant church, and it kind of, I had to keep reminding myself that they didn't have the real presence, and so that was something they could do. At the time, you never heard anybody talking in church. I don't like going to exposition a lot of places because as the priest, I have to spend so much time correcting people. But it's the same Lord. Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We want to show proper reverence, so that's a, a, something we should all make sure that we think about any time we're in His presence. Another thing, just uh, since the devil is in, in, the, in the readings today, I just recommend, it's readily available, Father uh, Chad Ruppiger's book on deliverance prayers for the laity, for anybody that uh, would like to uh, avail themselves of that sort of thing. Certainly, uh, uh, most priests don't do that, but the, uh, Father Ruppiger has put things together so somebody can, can help themselves. And there's also a little thing on, on the internet called Exilium Christian Orm that you can look into if anybody needs that or if you know somebody that needs that. Brethren, we exhort you that you receive not the grace of God in vain. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Why do so many of the people who are saved have to spend so much time in purgatory? Because they never made up their minds to become truly holy. They never made up their minds to strive for union with God in this life. But it's doable. It's doable. Today we're going to consider some very practical means for growing holy, some very practical means to attain to union with God in this life. And to do that, we'll be drawing largely from the teaching of that great doctor of the church, the great doctor of the interior life, St. John of the Cross. We'll also use some other reliable commentaries on his work that were written by two other Carmelite masters of the spiritual life, Father Gabriel of St. Mary Magdalene, and Blessed Father Lucas of St. Joseph. See, Blessed Father Lucas of St. Joseph had been the first pastor at Holy Family Parish in Tucson, Arizona, and he was later martyred in the Spanish Civil War. Now, for the sake of clarity, not every quote is going to be cited as usual. The quotes will be cut, pasted, and edited. Father Gabriel of St. Mary Magdalene explains the importance of St. John's work. Quote, St. John of the Cross's teaching applies to all Christians, lay or religious. It does not require a special state of life, but only a disposition of the will, namely, the desire of not wanting to be confined to mediocrity, and therefore of not refusing the generous renunciation required for attaining a more intimate union with God. In other words, this doctrine applies to everyone who does not want to live a Christian life by halves, but who wants to correspond in full measure to his vocation as a child of God and truly give to God the place that belongs to him in his heart, the place of an absolute preference above all others. Close quote. St. John of the Cross's teaching applies to everyone who doesn't want to live a Christian life by halves, everyone. In other words, his teaching is for everyone who truly wants to be a saint, who truly wants Christ to reign as the king of their heart. Let's turn to St. John the Cross to see how to overcome the obstacles to union with God in this life. St. John of the Cross, quote, it must first be noted that the evils which the soul receives come from the world, the devil, and the flesh. The world is the least difficult enemy. The devil is the hardest to understand. The flesh is the most tenacious of all, and its assaults continue for so long as the old man exists. In order to conquer any one of these three enemies, it is necessary to conquer all three. And if one is weakened, the other two are weakened. And when all three are conquered, no more war remains in the soul." Close quote. In order to conquer any one of these three enemies, and that's the world, 
the devil and the flesh. It's necessary to conquer all three. If one is weakened, then the other two are weakened. If one is weakened, then the other two are weakened. So the three enemies of the soul are the world, the devil, and the flesh. And as St. John points out, as we conquer one, the other two weaken. Let's see how to conquer them. And don't forget that this is doable. Today we're just going to consider the assaults of the world on the soul. St. John lists three obstacles that the world places in path of union with God. The first obstacle is an inordinate affection for any person. The second obstacle is a disorderly affection for worldly goods. And the third obstacle is the real or apparent bad example of our brethren. After a short overview of the principles involved in fighting the first two obstacles, we'll take a look at each obstacle then in turn. Uh, Father Gabriel of St. Mary Magdalene summarizes the principles at stake with the first two obstacles, because both of those concern a disorderly affection for creatures. Quote, God does not forbid us to love creatures. On the contrary, he often commands us to do so, but he wants us to love them in conformity with His will, and without attaching our hearts to them, in such a way that while enjoying the use of created goods, we do not refuse God the preference owed to Him." Close quote. God does not forbid us to love creatures. On the contrary, He often commands us to do so. But He wants us to love them in conformity to His will, and without attaching our hearts to them, in such a way, while enjoying the use of created goods, we don't refuse God the preference owed to Him. Okay, but what does it mean that we shouldn't attach our hearts to creatures? Shouldn't a husband's heart be attached to his wife? Shouldn't a mother's heart be attached to her children? I mean, this doesn't sound right. Well, if we were to use the common, everyday meaning of the word attachment, there would be a very great cause for concern. And oftentimes, pious people reading these kind of works get themselves wrapped around the axle because they don't actually understand what is meant here. Here's the key. St. John of the Cross is using this term attached in a very specific way. So we need to understand what he means when he speaks of attachments. In fact, it's absolutely essential to understand what he means by being attached if we're to make progress. Father Gabriel of St. Mary Magdalene explains, quote, For the saint, this is the meaning of the word attachment. Love that binds the heart in a way that is not according to the will of God or in an exaggerated manner, close quote. So an attachment is a love that binds the heart in a way that's not according to the will of God or in an exaggerated manner. Blessed Lucas remarks on this point, quote, St. John knew well the sensitivity of the human heart and how limited and self-centered its affections could become. He was well aware of the dangers of loving creatures solely for themselves. In an effort to prevent such an evil, St. John advocated that we love creatures not for their personal attraction towards us, but solely for the love of God. Like all masters of the spiritual life, he urges, urges a mortification of the affections, without which moral or spiritual advancement is impossible. Those who do not learn to properly control their hearts will never learn to become saints. Against such human weakness, St. John proposes the remedy. He forbids the slightest disorderly attachment which stands in the way of perfection." Close quote. So an attachment is a love that binds the heart in a way that's not according to the will of God or in an exaggerated manner. And one obvious uh, danger the world places in the path of the union of God. The first obstacle that St. John warns of is just such a love for another person. It's having an inordinate affection for any person. Father Gabriel, this can be found, it's often found, unfortunately, in the most legitimate affections. Does it not happen at times that a Christian mother cannot resign herself when her daughter wants to enter the convent? I guarantee that happens. But if there are reasonable guarantees that the vocation is genuine, to continue to oppose it for fear of the inevitable separation is no longer to love according to God. Close quote. Father Gabriel continues, Let us not forget God wants us to love creatures, but He does not want us to be attached to them. There are some affections that are not only legitimate, but even holy and positively willed by God. To give some examples of this, the mutual love of Christian spouses. 
and the love of a mother for her children. Do you think it could be the will of God that a mother not love her children, that she forget them? On the contrary, if she should do this, she would offend God. She would commit a grave sin, and St. John of the Cross certainly does not ask us to commit sins. Then what does St. John of the Cross mean when he writes of forgetting creatures and of leaving them according to the affection of the will? He is only telling us to avoid every inordinate affection, every attachment. Once again, for the saint, this is the meaning of the word attachment. Love that binds the heart in a way that is not according to the will of God or in an exaggerated manner. This can be found, is often found, unfortunately, in most legitimate affections. Close quote. For example, when someone loves a spouse or a child in a possessive way or in a selfish way and not as a child of God, when someone makes pleasure and not love the primary or final end of being with their spouse. Understanding the proper love of neighbors that we're all called to by Christ and distinguishing it from a disordered love is such an important point that we'll consider the comments of Blessed Lucas of St. Joseph. Quote, the actual words of St. John of the Cross concerning love of neighbor are, quote, love which is born of sensuality ends in sensuality, that which is born of God ends in God. This is the difference between these two loves so that man may distinguish between them, close quote. So love which is born of sensuality ends in sensuality, that which is born of God ends in God. St. John of the Cross then is not the enemy of love. He wishes the heart to be purified so it can contain a greater love. So it may be capable of loving not only God, but loving all in God and for God. Whatever according to him is just and lovable. The spiritual advancement of a soul is like the flight of an eagle. The higher it soars, the greater the freedom with which it flies and the keener is its sight. When selfishness or natural sympathy motivates our love, it becomes narrow and limited. Such a soul is completely absorbed with self and there's no room for love of others. When a man begins to love his neighbor primarily for the love of God, then his spiritual vision increases, his heart is liberated, and the capacity for loving embraces all men. The more closely a soul approaches God by its sanctity of life, the more it resembles God. As God loves the entire human race collectively and yet delights in each soul individually, so the true friends of God love all mankind and each individual. The saints excluded no one from their affections, yet they did not love each with the same degree of intensity. They had a special love for those who were nearest to God, but a paternal love for those who were most in need of it because they were the farthest away from God. In proportion to their sanctity, three characteristics predominate. A sincere practical love for all, a predilection for those closest to God, and a paternal solicitude for those in greatest need. Close quote, Blessed Lucas of St. Joseph. So the saints sincerely loved all mankind and each individual. They didn't exclude anyone, but they don't love everybody with the same degree of intensity. They have a special love for those who are the closest to God. They have paternal love for those who are most in need of it because they're the farthest from God. Okay. Now let's consider St. John of the Cross warnings about disorderly affection for worldly goods. St. John. With respect to temporal good things, it is needful if thou wouldst truly free thyself and moderate the excesses of thine appetite to abhor all kinds of possession and to have no care for them neither as to food, nor clothing, nor any other created thing, nor as to the morrow. Thou must direct this care to something higher, namely to seeking the kingdom of God, that is, not fearing God, and the rest, as His Majesty says, shall be added unto us. For he that cares the beast will not be forgetful of thee. In this way thou shalt attain silence and peace in the senses." Close quote. Now it's essential to keep in mind that the goal here is to obtain union with God in this life, which requires a heart that is free from all attachments, a heart that's free to truly love God. In regard to possessions then, as, we've, as Father Gabriel of St. Mary Magdalene points out, St. John is only telling us to avoid every inordinate affection, every attachment, every love that binds the, way, the heart in a way that's not according to the will of God or an exaggerated matter. Why though? Because these attachments draw us away from God. They impede our union with Him. To the degree we're attached to something that isn't God, that's the very degree we're not attached to God. Our heart 
we want to have single focus on heart. And that's what St. John of the Cross tells us how to do. Father Gabriel, quote, one who to satisfy his taste and appetite would go to the excessive gluttony would evidently be attached to such satisfactions. Or one who's finicky about food, attached to a soft life, attached to tobacco, beer, cigarettes, soft drinks, etc. Or someone that couldn't renounce a legitimate recreation, sports, games, other amusements, looking at their phone. Well, there's a duty of office or a duty of charity to fulfill would undoubtedly show himself to be attached to it. Often each of us is attached little or much to so many things. These attachments draw us away from God and conceal and impede the interior life. They impede intimate union with God. St. John does not ask anything that cannot be done even by a layman who has many duties of state and family. In re reality, it's not a matter of suppressing these, of forgetting them. Quite to the contrary, it is a matter of suppressing all excessive and useless attachments, which are too exclusively worldly and therefore not according to God. It's not a matter of material separation from things. St. Louis was the king of France, and he was detached in the way he was supposed to be. Immensely rich. But then uh, St. Catherine Drexel, over in Philadelphia, the Drexel family, you know, right up there with the J.P. Morgan, one of the richest women in the world. But she was attached to her wealth. So it's not a matter of material separation from things. That's not it. It's the renunciation of every attachment. There should not be attachments in anyone, not in, even in one on whom depend the most extensive social duties. A man can be detached from everything, not only domestic life, but also in social and political life. Indeed, everyone could be so. Close quotes, Father Gabriel of St. Mary Magdalene. In regard to possessions, then, St. John is only telling us to avoid every inordinate affection, every attachment, every love that binds the heart in a way that's not according to the will of God or in an exaggerated manner. Why? Because these attachments drag us away from God and they impede our union with Him. It's not a matter of material separation of things, but the renunciation of every attachment. There should not be attachments in anyone. In other words, we should own our possessions our possessions shouldn't own us. We should own our possessions, but our possessions should not own us. Blessed Lucas sums all this up. Quote, the following beautiful passage confirms and illustrates St. John's doctrine on the advantage of detachment from creatures. St. John, the more a heart withdraws itself from earthly attachments, the more it prepares itself for the love of God and neighbor. When the affections are freed from natural motives, the soul loves creatures that God wills them to be loved. Such a love results in liberty of spirit and a greater love of God for his own sake. The deeper our love of God becomes, the more we love our neighbor, since the principle of both loves is the same." Close quote. So the more the heart withdraws itself from earthly attachments, the more it prepares itself for love of God and neighbor. When affections are free from natural motives, the soul loves creatures as God wills them to be loved. Such a love results in liberty of spirit and a greater love of God for his own sake. The deeper our love of God becomes, the more we love our neighbor, since the principle of both loves are the same. The principle of both loves is charity. The greater our charity, the greater our love of God, and the greater our love of neighbor. We continue with St. John of the Cross's third and last warning about the world, which has to do with the real or apparent bad example of our brethren and the necessity of minding our own business. And in terms of minding our own business, we mean exactly that. This admonition has to be understood as applying to persons for whom we are not actually <coughs> responsible. Okay, so St. John. The third caution is very necessary. Many, through not observing it, have not only lost the peace and blessings of their souls, but have fallen and habitually fallen into many evils and sins. This caution is that thou should keep thyself with all diligence from setting thy thoughts upon what happens in the community. He's speaking here of religious communities, but the principles apply with equal force the parish, diocese, and the church, our little small town. And still more from speaking of it. Nor should thou ever be shocked or marvel at anything that thou sees or hears, but should strive to keep thy soul in forgetfulness of it all. 
For if thou desirest to consider any of these things, even though thou live among angels, many things in them will seem to thee to be amiss, since thou wilt not understand the substance of them. <coughs> Take here for an example Lot's wife, who because she was troubled at the perdition of the Sodomites and looked backwards to see what was happening, was punished by God, who turned her into a statue of salt. <coughs> by this, understand that even though thou may live among devils, God wills thee to live among them in such a way that thou not look back in thy thoughts at their business, but abandon them wholly, striving to keep thy soul pure and sincere with God, undisturbed by thoughts either of one thing or another. Thou mayest take it for certain that communities will never be without some occasion of stumbling, since there are never wanting devils who strive to overthrow the saints. And God permits this in order to exercise them and test them. And if thou do not do this, thou can never attain a holy detachment recollection. For however good be thy aim, and however great thy zeal, the devil will entrap thee either in one place or another. And thou art already securely entrapped, and that thou not permit thy soul to be distracted in any of these ways. Remember that which is said by the Apostle St. James, quote, If any man thinketh himself to be religious, not bridling his tongue, this man's religion is vain. Close quote, James 1.26. This is to be understood no less of inward speech than of outward. Thus St. John of the Cross. Now, I have the privilege of knowing uh, quite a few holy people, and I mean holy in the formal sense. I don't know a single one who spends any significant amount of time on the Catholic blogs or keeping track of the chaos in the church. If someone is in a position of authority or responsibility, he needs to keep himself in informed insofar as his duty requires, and that's for everyone in their state of life. But no more than that. It's a temptation to go outside what we need to take care of. And we do need to be informed. We're not supposed to be ostriches, but we have to be very, very careful because there's an appetite to go outside that, huh? As priests, since we're spiritual fathers, we have to do, keep more track of the chaos in the church than, than other people. Uh, so there's a certain degree that we have to do. I hate it. It's very dangerous. It's very, very dangerous. Blessed Lucas has a very enlightening commentary on this warning. Quote, The third obstacle which the world raises against perfection is the real or apparent bad example of our brethren. It is necessary to distinguish between the two basic causes of scandal, lest we fall prey to our own error. A heart which is not completely purified and filled with charity is very subjective. To him people do not appear as they actually are, but rather as a reflection of what he is himself. In this case, the cause of the scandal is only in the person scandalized. And this explains the words, if thou considers any of these things, even thou live among angels, many of them will appear to you be amiss, since thou will not be able to understand the substance of them. This is important. A heart that is not completely purified and filled with charity is very subjective. So things won't appear as they actually are, but as a reflection of the person himself. The other cause of scandal is ignorance or false interpretation of the neighbor's actions. When the soul has not been purified by a thorough knowledge of its own weaknesses, and the heart is not filled with charity, one is always looking for defects in his neighbor. This is not true of the saints who are sincere lovers of the truth. Since they are realists, they believe the truth has nothing to hide. So they accept things as they are, not as they would like them to be. At other times, the cause of the scandal is exterior, as when we actually see someone performing a dissatisfying action. You know, and in the current state of the church, this is almost the rule. Blessed Lucas, we are not living with angels, but with men, who are still struggling through the thorns and mire of temptation. Since no one is secure against these dangers, as long as he lives in the world, St. John advises both charity and prudence in dealing with our neighbors. Neither should you ever be shocked at marvel at anything you see or hear, since God permits many devils to strive to overcome the saints. Now, the fact that, that God permits devils to do this is sometimes surprising to people. One of the ways that the evil spirits most frequently tempt men is to suggest thoughts regarding their neighbor's faults. And the devil represents these thoughts vividly and falsely, trusting the weak soul will spread about his misunderstandings, thereby adding sin to sin. Then he fills the soul with mistaken zeal by causing it to believe it has become aware of this weakness so that the soul may commend the person concerned to God. So one of the most common ways uh, of a man to be tempted is for him to have the devil to suggest thoughts regarding his neighbor. The, the devil represents those thoughts vividly and falsely, trusting that the weak soul will spread abroad his misunderstandings. 
And he fills the soul with mistaken zeal, causing it to believe it's aware of this weakness, so the soul may commend a person concerned to God. There are souls so lacking in the true spirit of charity, they delight in ferreting out the weaknesses of their neighbor. Thinking themselves free of these defects, they reveal the weaknesses of others, and, and do not understand that ways of divine providence for sanctifying his elect. In this way, such souls are guilty of the very faults they criticize in others. God allows us to see our brethren fall into sin. Not only that we can practice patience and charity, but that we also may profit by their example. When we see the defects in others, we should wonder if we are guilty of the same weaknesses, realizing that if we do not possess them now, we would easily do so at a later date. While we're living this world, no matter where we direct our eyes, we will see the deficiencies of men. And if we had the power to look within the recesses of our own souls, we would be overwhelmed by the multitude of serious defects, perhaps even the sins we would find there. In 1 Corinthians 10, 12, St. Paul warns us, He that thinketh himself to stand, let him take heed, lest he fall. Anyone who is easily scandalized at the faults of his neighbor displays his utter ignorance of the laws of divine providence governing the sanctification of souls and demonstrates his lack of knowledge of human weakness. Such a lack of understanding is nothing more than a pretense for criticizing the neighbor, while at the same time it reveals a complete lack of charity. Nothing ever scandalizes the truly great soul who realizes the one most harm by a fault which has been committed is the person committing the fault. St. John of the Cross uses forceful language warning us we should not enjoy peace even if we loved among angels, unless we refrain from what is no concern of ours. Now it seems to me, just as, as a human being, but uh, that most people, or many people, I shouldn't say most, but many people have this whole principle upside down and backwards in our society. They keep track of virtually everything going on in the parish, the chancery, Rome, Hollywood, etc., and their kids are running around like a little bunch of little Apaches. It's just completely upside down and backwards. The very things that we're supposed to be most concerned with, they're not concerned with. This is a trick. It's an inversion of the right order of things. So, so St. John of the Cross uses forceful language warning us we shall not enjoy peace even if we lived among angels unless we refrain from what is no concern of ours. He supplements this strong and wise admonition thus. Even if you were to live among devils, God still requires you to live oblivious of their shortcomings, keeping your soul pure and holy in the sight of God, being completely undisturbed by what is transpiring all around you. I mean, who cares about Hollywood? These are people that pretend to be other people. And you can't believe how many people will talk to me about it. I, you know, like, who cares? Seriously. What, what is going on? You're not going to go in holiness if you pay any attention to that stuff at all. Zippo, nada, none. You can't go anywhere. You're just stuck in the mud. Okay? Even if you were live, to live among devils, God still requires you to live oblivious of their shortcomings, keeping your soul pure and holy in the sight of God, being completely undisturbed by what is transpiring all around you. Since St. John uses such strong language, this doctrine must be of the greatest importance. Close quote, Blessed Lucas of St. Joseph. Okay, let's close. Today we've seen there's three enemies of the soul. We know that. The world, the devil, and the flesh. St. John teaches that the world is the least difficult enemy. The devil is the hardest to understand, while the flesh is the most tenacious of all. The next time we approach this topic, we'll take a look at his teaching on the devil. Today we took a quick look at the three obstacles that the world places in the path of union with God. The first obstacle is inordinate affection for any person. The second obstacle is disorderly affection for worldly goods. And the third obstacle is the real or apparent bad example of our brethren. Overcoming each one of these obstacles is doable. It's doable by everybody that really wants to be a saint, who truly wants Christ to reign as the king of their hearts. It's doable. This is doable.